<clears throat> okay, well, I'm the critic here. Um, talk to me afterwards. The, the Fuse's print is all wrong. It's a transfer to DVD. It's all dark and scratchy looking. So as I said, hang on to whatever version you've got. I have to go back to the lab. Uh, I'm really thrilled with the meat joint. I finished it uh, just two weeks ago. I think the sound is too, uh, there's too much voice. What do you think? Too much voice? Not enough voice? She likes it? Uh, voice is great? Well, the French is great. I appreciated somebody chuckling because uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's crazy. All right, uh, <clears throat> I've been editing intensively with this wonderful grant for EAI, and I have four new, completely new works. One is uh, very funny, I think it's shriekingly funny. It's called Americana Eating Apple Pie, in which I cook an apple pie with all the tools from my garage. Uh, mentioning garage, I should just let you know, I still live in the old house in Fuses, and, uh, that's the same base in Kitch's last meal, and um, maybe maybe other works. So I'm going to start with um, recent recent work, um, terminal velocity. My assistant there will have it. We're doing a PowerPoint duet here, uh, or trio. Change the projector. Okay. I guess what I'm thinking about is how we are all falling through space right now. Um, I was hoping that I could have some, something of the uh, standing back with a sense of uh, erotic and positive resistance that characterize Fuses and Meat Joy. They're two works that are based within the menace of the Vietnam War. Uh, by 1961, before Fuses and uh, before Meat Joy, at the University of Illinois, James Tenney and I meet a young poet who uh, tells us that um, American troops are bombing and burning villages in her country. We've never heard of Vietnam, but we're going to uh, continuously be conscious of it after this fortuitous meeting. Terminal velocity, of course, is my uh, photo enlargements from 2001. It was, as usual with my work, not a, a programmatic considered work, next image, Mary, but something uh, in the world that I wanted to get closer to. I wanted to experience an increased intimacy with this disaster. And I want to say that from the very beginning, from the very first images I saw, there was no question in my mind, there's absolutely no question that this was somehow facilitated by however many uh, deranged foreigners that had presumably crashed their planes through these impenetrable buildings. As someone in my local New Paltz town meeting said, when the first plane went through, I thought, this is incredible. When the second plane went through, he said, we have to have done this. So this is a matter of uh, question and dissension, and it's something that in the very imagery questions the invulnerability and the righteousness of our culture. Um, the fact that these thousands of citizens at work in a normal course of their day were either flung out of the building because it was exploding from heat and fire or had, I mean, the choice was incarceration or leaping. So I wanted to make uh, um, a memorial related, I guess, to my work with mortal coils of five years earlier, uh, a kind of in memoriam. But when the work was first, first shown, next slide, I um, mean, next image, um, Mary, there was um, a, a very violent reaction 
from a lot of visitors to the gallery, and I had to analyze what was this ferocious uh, antagonism to the sequence of enlargements. And it had to do with betraying Americana mythologies of righteousness and invulnerability. Um, there were issues of an artist taking advantage of um, a disaster, aestheticizing it. But I should mention now, if I find my little list, something that's kind of fun. The list has probably disappeared. But it's an interesting little list. Uh, it has to do with my ineptitudes. Let's see, what's the next image here? Yeah, my ineptitudes go back to learning to really paint, and this is uh, at university when my partner, still at the time, James Tenney, would be exhausted, and uh, I would say, could you please be my model, because then you can just go to sleep. So this was an important series of works, and uh, it was censored by the art department, because again, it was the early precedents for invading masculine prerogatives. Uh, in 1960, this was considered an obscenity to show uh, a respected student male naked depicted by uh, his girlfriend. And to uh, have his genital exposed was considered shameful. So this was a precedent for the um, intrusions into masculine traditions and values. Are we okay? So here's my little list of ineptitudes. Um, first, I enter the art world, which is all misogynist in the 60s. You can do whatever you want, but don't expect it to mean anything. Uh, we like that you're painting like a man, but uh, you'll have no authority. You might as well forget art, my best teacher said. Uh, don't set your heart on art. You're only a girl. Uh, next image. So all my paintings were wrong. This early portrait of Stan Brackage's original partner, Jane Brackage, pregnant, was considered uh, just impossible. The legs are too big. She looks like a caged animal. The stomach is too fat. She's pregnant. Um, next image. Uh, the landscapes are not really abstract or they're not realistic enough. This is the University of Illinois. I'm considered unteachable. But here, the energies from uh, nature and natural forms are, are the tremendous uh, vocabulary and energy for me. Next one. So I'm outside. I'm dragging everything with me. Uh, into the landscape, I want to be in that direct immediate, immediate in the, that immediacy, but I'm always going to fail as a painter because everything is changing. Um, the aromas, the atmosphere, the wind, and of course then I get pregnant. Next image. And the next. Uh, inexplicable collage um, using domestic elements which were very satisfying. Uh, my grandmother's red glass pitcher and a stick that I carried around with me wherever I went for five years that finally solves the whole dimensionality of the work. I don't know if it's quite in focus, but iconographically it relates to childhood drawings when I'm four years old trying to understand a staircase. It still bewilders me. And of course, if you ever see interior scroll folded properly from the side, it's that uh, repeated configuration. So I don't know what it means. Uh, next image.
um, by, by a miracle, we escape Illinois because uh, Jim Tenney gets a job at Bell Telephone Labs as experimental composer in residence, and I find a loft on 29th Street, Papadopoulos' abandoned ferrier loft for half a city block for $47 a month because New York uh, economically is being disembodied of its small manufacturers and artists moved in. This is the last open territory. This is our Wild West. And the young women teach each other to, next one, to, uh, to wire, to put our electric wiring into our commercial neighbor's space so that we don't have to pay for it. Um, and I begin to use all these inappropriate materials Papadopoulos' abandoned furs. Next one. So that's going to lead me to uh, large installations with uh, the abandoned fur cutting boards of Papadopoulos. These are the perfect kinds of can wooden canvases. They're full of pinholes. And I'm motorizing the work because that's something that uh, the men doing collage have not done. They don't have their elements in motion. Next one. So here I begin to incorporate the body. As a lot of you know, it's 1963. I body uh, 36 transformative actions for camera. So now I'm, I'm making it. No, I haven't made it through uh, misogyny yet because um, these images are taken to important curators and they all to a man and they were only men say. Um, uh, this is exhibitionism and narcissism, and um, if you really want to paint, get the body out of here. So the body is disruptive, next image, and I want it to be an inclusive element, uh, and as you know, my mantra then was, I, can I be both the image and the image maker? And uh, in the 60s, it's still completely a resisted possibility. And I always like to remind anyone who's listening to uh, talking about these images that in the 60s, there was no neutral pronoun, as my little struggle with Ihab Hassan in the 70s alluded to here at a conference. Everything was only masculinized, every cultural reference, man and his images, uh, man and his coats, uh, the artist and his materials, uh, every student will move his car. So this exclusionary language meant that I was already a kind of a criminal, marginalized intruder. And the other aspect that we have to remember, next one, Mary. Um, there was no pronoun and there was no authentic, to me, depiction of heterosexual pleasure. Um, you couldn't say cunt, vagina, cum, lubricity. You just couldn't do that unless you were a doctor or a pornographer. And so I wanted to enter into this uh, distorted terrain. Next image. This is one of the last paintings, and it's an homage to Lou Andrea Salome, who was a president in her cultural uh, disruption of Freud's theories of narcissism, as well as her um, inspiring relationship with the poet Rilke. Next one, let's see where we're going. Okay, part of the des despicable materials that I continue to use were these fur installations. Um, next one, go. By this time, oh, we've, I've come through the mis misogyny, the narcissism, um, and now we're passing through years of essentialism, which are going to maintain itself. And now I've got um, uh, racial inappropriateness, which, of course, by the end of the 60s, nascent feminist issues are beginning, and they're going to be influenced hugely um, by the civil rights struggle. 
that's going to be part of the uh, sort of overwhelming discrepancy in our culture as it remains to a different extent. And as the Vietnam War was intensively a, a racist um, incursion. So just a simple performative work, next one, uh, using, as usual, my, my mixed groups with uh, physical intimacy was a source of um, conventionalizing objection. Next one. OK, we've seen Me Joy. That has to do with uh, um, excessive sensuality, heterosexual depiction. Next one. And um, what else was wrong about it? Uh, probably paganism, yeah. <laughs> There were also social issues about using uh, meat stuff when people were starving and hungry. And we had to have a footnote on the program that said, uh, all these fish and chickens and sausages are week old and could not be sold for human consump consumption, uh, at least not in New York City. Next one. Okay, let's just go through Meat Joy. I'll say again that the motive for Fuses in Meat Joy had to do with a sense of uh, taking intimacy and an erotics and positing it against um, the militaristic this kind of irreducible technology and aggression in Vietnam and then in Cambodia. And then where else did we go? Um, the Dominican Republic and change, please. And change, excuse is. But one of the things later relating to the imagery, the self-shot uh, intimacy of fuses is something that I would quote for Jonathan Shea from his book, Achilles in Vietnam. The overwhelming majority of combat veterans whom I have known are painfully aware of the absence of intimacy, tenderness, light playfulness, or easy mutuality in their sex lives. For many, sex is as sure a trigger of intrusive recollection and emotion from Vietnam as the sound of explosions or the smell of a corpse. Sex and anger are so intertwined that they often cannot conceive of tender, uncoerced, sex that is free of rage. And uh, that's from this incredible psychiatrist's work, Achilles in Vietnam. He's treating traumatized veterans and writes that. OK. By 1965, uh, next image, when I'm editing fuses, the disasters of the war are increasing. In February, President Johnson, 65, authorized the first air raids into North Vietnam. And two weeks later, he began sustained daily bombing of North Vietnam. Later in February, Malcolm X was killed. Then on March 7th, in Selma, Alabama, peaceful civil rights marchers set, setting off for Montgomery in their church clothes were beaten to the ground by local law enforcement personnel. Viola Liuzzi, a white supporter and mother from Michigan, was murdered in her car as she gave one of the marchers a ride home. Um, she's also vilified and in the press south and north described as possibly having an affair uh, with one of the black civil rights workers. Uh, by 1965, 66, I'm working on my anti-Vietnam War film, uh, Snows. And I'm going to build uh, a large performance work. It's a complex installation. The media uh, sequences are all 
controlled by the audience without their knowing it. I've worked with uh, electronic, no, not electronic arts, intermixed with Bell Telephone Lab uh, technicians in building, next image, um, underwire, underwiring um, energy movement transfers into all the media systems with the Bell Telephone Lab engineers so that every third seat is wired and when the audience is most restive and disturbed by an image, the image will speed up and get faster. Uh, when they become quiet and slow down, the images are slowed down. And this is a complex system of uh, Super 8 audio sound uh, slides, and you'll just be able to get some vague sense of it through the PowerPoint. Next one, please. But I'm happy to report that I have finally, last week, edited the performance documents, which is part of the pattern that I'm describing of the recent work. Next one. And the next image. During this time, I'm teaching classes in movement to resist uh, police barricades and police intrusions on peaceful marchers. Um, so some of the exercises that have um, developed my kinetic theater through the 60s are now being put to political use. And I'm also counseling draft resistors in a private, um, it's not a clinic, just privately counseling draft resistors and teaching them, actually breaking them down over a weekend so that no one that I ever counsel has ever, was ever um, inducted. Next, next. And the next, uh, I mean, this, this is our, our surround, and it's endless. By 1968, people, we have tried to raise the Pentagon. We have organized communes, communities. We have a, a tremendous number of resources that we don't have now. Uh, we had Liberation News, we had Eye of Stone, we have East Village Other, we have the Fugs. There's a constant interchange even between artists and the weather people. We know them, they get inspired by events and happenings. So there's a sense of intensive change, political dynamic, and as if we um, have some kind of effect at the same time our phones are being tapped, our mail is being opened, next. And when there are actions in which only three or four people have committed themselves to appearing in St. Mark's, I mean in St. Peter's Church, and tearing open their coats uh, to reveal signage and images against the ward, they're grabbed from behind and dragged out mysteriously when there's only three or four people that knew what the event would be. So it's, it's sinister and uh, so incredibly pervasive. Let's see where the body goes next, given all this. Um, oh, scoot through these two up to including her limits. Go past interior scroll. Well, here, let's just stop for a moment and see there's that configuration of the repeated kind of steps. Next, okay, this is where I'm going to get rid of uh, ideality, of performance, of training, of time structures. It starts, I'm back home from England um, after what I called the benign exile of everything falling apart in 1968. By 1960, is it by 1968 that the Kennedys are assassinated, that Malcolm X is assassinated, King will later be assassinated. Um, John Lennon will be assassinated on the night that I finish editing this footage back home in near Woodstock, New York. 
So we were surrounded at this time by an overt assassination culture, which has now become much more subtle and imprecise and uh, less explicit. You really have to force yourself to look at the configuration of Senator Wellstone's plane, a plane built like a tank going down. Um, the labor secretary, was he labor secretary Brown? Ron Brown? Um, Commerce. Hmm? Commerce. What? Secretary of Commerce. Secretary of Commerce, thank you. And was it the governor in Missouri who was running against um, Rumsfeld, was he running? Ashcroft. Ashcroft. A plane goes down. Uh, and the most insightful researchers, such as Gary Webb, putting together the configuration of arms, gold, drugs, and the Bush family, as uh, mysteriously able to shoot himself twice in the face. Um, but back to nature. My, my neighbor is pruning the old apple tree, and he leaves this rope configuration. Uh, my partner, Auntie McCall, says, yeah, why don't I photograph you in that next image? This will become a work that occupies me for the next uh, six or seven years, in which I'm trying to find a way to turn the body into the agency of marking and drawing without repeating my own uh, painterly habits. So perhaps I repeat them, but I'm trying to strip away all the structures around the performative. So I'm able to do this work by living in the space for seven or eight hours or overnight, and I just go on and off the rope. I've got a tree surgeon's harness. I can raise it, I can lower it. Next image, please. And produce these sequences of drawing. Oh, go back one, Mary. So this is the image. No, go back one more. This is 1975, and this is where I present this work here at a conference. And um, I hope he's not here tonight. Uh, there's a small, aggressive man in the audience. When I, and it's a small audience. It's more intimate, uh, artists and critics and historians. And he keeps saying, whatever you describe about this work is inaccurate. This work is iconographically and historically inhabited by bondage and the symbolic female being uh, stressed and tied up. And I'm arguing with him and I'm saying, well, weren't you ever a kid? Didn't you ever go on a swing? Didn't you ever see what that momentum is so freeing? And he says, there's no way that you can impose your essentialist um, I Reality on what is uh, an immutable symbology of, and so I say to the people on the conference table, get this old guy out of here. I can't, pre you know, I can't explain the work. Make him go. And they're giving me a very unhappy look, and they say, that's Irving Goffman. He, he's, you know, he he's the guru of social science and behaviorism. I don't know, you knew Mary, but <sighs> so that was part of my adventure when I was here before. So there are things that have definitely improved for all of us. Um, certainly by the time feminism, essentialism, goddess worship, and pantheism have calmed down to open up an extensive research into lost history and new intensive contributions from women in, in every realm. Uh, we've neutralized the language but the, the structure of uh, domination, war, and aggressivity has realigned itself with increased technological and extended capitalist power. And it's more spread out, so that it's really hard to see 
that this is a focus where culturally we might make a difference. And I also believe that through all the assassinations and um, the, the vitiation of cultural community, the, the, the powers that be have learned to put the people into a bit of a trance where they are to shop and feel comfortable and be very afraid and uneasy of what is actually their uh, political inheritance. Next image, next image, next image. Okay, for time. We, with fresh blooded remorphology, I'm able to introduce explicit um, visceral principles of the female body, of menstrual symbology, the interior, the exterior. And it's a work that starts off first as a lecture regarding blood taboos and then. Uh, accumulates a vocabulary of vector shapes, next. And at some point, um, presenting the lecture, a, a provider says, why don't you put yourself in the imagery? And that becomes an endeavor over the next four or five years and results in a sculptural uh, format of transparent panels with the um, vector images printed on them transparently and including um, embedded video monitors of the performance of fresh blood or dream morphology. So it, it's a breakthrough work for me because the forbidden or confused issues are now uh, formally made elegant and perceptible and I'm able to integrate these different formats all at once. Next one. Um, the war, the destruction of Palestinian culture in Lebanon becomes my obsession in 1981. I'm studying everything I can find about Lebanon, the history of uh, Palestinians and the ancient Hebrew settlements being part of uh, one nomadic grouping and the Palestinians go north and settle in what becomes Lebanon with their multiple gods and goddesses and uh, amazing uh, sacred structures, whereas the monotheists remain south and uh, will, hundreds of years later, be embattled with their same genetic cousins. Next. So War Mob <clears throat> has a video, um, just a, a scan, a span <clears throat> of destroyed Lebanese and Palestinian villages. Next one. This is one of the last works I'll show. It's important because it, um, and they're terrible reproductions, but it takes actions and images of works that I've inhabited and through a series of wonderful coincidences and unexpected juxtapositions um, puts them in connection. And in each case, the relationship was uh, found unexpectedly. It's a work from the mid 90s that incorporates images that are archaic and historic and from my own series of um, activations. And it's important to me at the time because it intensifies uh, a cultural conversation that crosses um, many delineations. The other wonderful things that have happened is that Roe versus Wade um, has been put into passage. We have contraceptions. 
we have explicit language. I've mentioned that. And we also have uh, an expanding and inclusive sexuality that is no longer uh, predetermined to be heterosexual. So by the time we're in the 90s, or the late 70s even, women are, and men are free to come out of their closets to experiment, um, to introduce a whole extended range of uh, sexual experience and expression. Next one. So I, I really am so fond of this little uh, Nerubian goddess. She's an owl goddess, and I want her there because she's about the explicit body. She's shameless. Um, she has a kind of clitoral nose. And she relates to that image um, that I made in 1968 of body collage. Next one. The two lions. I found that in, um, in a National Geographic in some dentist's office, and I kept looking at it and saying, it reminds me of something I've seen before. Hmm. Oh, it's the faces from fuses, the orgasmic heads. OK. And then the little uh, um, Alaskan goddess, that, that little vulva goddess, She's so remarkable because originally she had arms, you know, and they would have been made out of straw or something. So then I studied that figuration and I thought, well, if you get your vulva, you lose your arms. If you have your arms, you don't have your vulva. When are we going to put it all together? <laughs> Next image. Cyclonic imprints in the 90s, mid 90s, is a vocabulary of double curve. There's 17 motorized violins and continuous projection of 180 slides, morphing vulvic double curve, uh, the cycladic sculptures, the violins. Next one. Is that a note for me? The time is out? No, OK. Um, so the, the image on the left, that's just, again, supposed to be part of a vocabulary of double curves in motion and it became the whoops image when this work was presented in a few museums where it needs that scale of 10 feet by 30 feet. Next image. This is not whoops, this is classical good behavior. Okay, next is So it's a shimmering work. It's really, it's, it's quite gorgeous. And the violins are um, really in this small scale to the projection space. And they're motorized, and they're making sound. Uh oh well I, I can't I can't leave Volva completely out. Um, but I, I'm running out of time. So I hope that if you have a chance, you'll get a recent um, catalog in which the evolution of the vocabulary of Volva's morphia is described. It's um, this photographic grid usually with uh, fans that blow the images, and the images are again to reintegrate the history of genital sexuality, taking Paleolithic inscriptions, that's the third column to your right, and they're wonderful because they're tiny, and they're from caves, and what's special about them is how various the depiction of the symbology is. It's um, so far away from our traditional obscenities, although I put a few of those in the vocabulary here also. Uh, I think it's one of my favorite works, but I'm going to um, leave it to you to make a research, and let's go back to the end. 
Well, there they are. Well, wait one minute. They're very funny. Uh, they're shot from real life, from archaic cultures, sacred cultures, and the, uh, the crocodile. I had to have it. It's the vagina de Tanta. It's for you boys. And it was very, um, unfortunately, the logo for a restaurant on 23rd Street. <laughs> and as soon as I saw it, I said, I got to shoot this very quickly, because this restaurant will fail. <laughs> and it did. Next group. Yeah. So the little scientific vulva, um, they're marvelous and strange. Again, the three in are the Paleolithic. And one before was an old boyfriend. Next. And the next one. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to end back where I started. Uh, something very remarkable happened, which is the kind of coincidence that uh, is inspiring and confirming for me. A very large book arrived in the mail. Darn, I didn't write it down, but it's to replace um, Jansen, it's the history of art and culture with a reintegration of um, abandoned cultures and issues that have never been properly integrated previously into art history. And I was amazed and thrilled to see that this work, Terminal Veloci Velocity, occupies the last, the very last page of this huge, it's a six, 500 page compendium and under the reproduction of my work was this um, text from a Polish poet that you might know, but I didn't know of her, Wisława Zembrowska. Uh, she had the Nobel Prize, is that right? Yes, okay. Um, and this is the poem that was translated from Polish that's put under my image. Photograph from September 11th. They jumped from the burning stories down, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. A photograph captured them while they were alive and now preserves them, above ground, toward the ground, each still whole with their own face and blood well hidden. There is still time for their hair to be tossed and for keys and small change to fall from their pockets. They are still in the realm of the air, within the places which have opened. There are only two things I can do for them, to describe this flight and not to add a word. Thank you.